Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Christine. May I begin by saying thank you very much for Christine for stepping in a week ago to give this seminar when a vacancy arose. And it's great to see people here this afternoon, given it was a busy afternoon in the CCG. So thank you for coming. Um, I'm sure most of you know Christine better than I, but by way of introduction, Christine's research interests are predominantly in understanding discretion within criminal justice, including youth justice. Um, after uh, a strong developing a strong track web record in sentencing disparities research, Christine has shifted to legal responses to, to domestic and family violence, which forms the background to the talk today. And this has resulted in a return to policing research with current projects including police attitudes to domestic and family violence as well as um, an evaluation of the QPS Gold Coast Domestic Violence Task Force. So the seminar today is an evaluation of the Specialist Domestic and Family Violence Court Trial in Southport. This report has just been tabled in the Queensland Parliament. The Specialist Court was set up in response to the recommendations of the Not Now, Not Ever report and commenced in September of 2015. And um, this is a 12 month evaluation. Okay, thank you uh, for coming. Um, and I apologise in advance for my voice. I've had the flu. Um, I'm told it sounds really good, but I'm pretty good last. <laughs> um, and also for those from CCJ, thank you for popping up. I sense we've just finished assessment board. Um, such a fun activity that is. So I'd like to acknowledge um, a number of um, organisations and individuals who were particularly good about facilitating the data collection um, for this project. Um, and that's all uh, that's the Department of Justice and Attorney General, Queensland Courts, Queensland Police Service, Legal Aid Queensland, uh, the Chief Magistrate who gave us permission to come in and talk and interview two magistrates. Um, as well as the magistrates in the two court sites um, that we did the research in for this evaluation. Uh, all those who participated in um, the research, which did include victims and perpetrators of family violence, and um, which has always been a very interesting experience. I'm still getting the odd phone call from perpetrators who wish to give me their account mm. of their court process. Um, so they're still finding my name and number somewhere. <laughs> And finally, the Domestic and Family Violence Court Reform Team who managed uh, the tender process and the evaluation um, through, um, through the last uh, few months. So this is what I spent my study leave last year doing. Um, it wasn't the original plan, <coughs> um, but the tender came out and we were lucky to get it. And um, essentially my four month study leave became four months of data collection and writing a report and then rewriting the report because they had a very long feedback cycle um, imposed uh, for it as well. So what I'd like to talk a bit about today is the purpose of the 12 month evaluation. Um, Jackie's just told you a little bit about what the court is, but I'll, um, I'll also define that and look a bit more in depth about uh, specialist courts and their function in this field. The structure of the evaluation, so it's design and then some key findings um, that have come out of this. So what happened was, they not now, not even a report came out, which many of you will know is the, was uh, chaired by um, by Quentin Bryce and looked at legal responses to domestic and family violence in Queensland. It was quite strikingly not positive in many respects around the ways in which our legal systems had responded to domestic and family violence. It had oh, well over 100 recommendations in the report and one of those recommendations were regarding how courts deal with domestic and family violence and called for a specialist court approach. This was established in Southport um, and was already in progress, so they'd already started it before they called for the evaluation. So the design is somewhat hampered by the fact that we've had to go into something that was already existing and in progress at the time that we were asked to evaluate it. So what they were looking for is they'd already set up a program logic, they'd already set up their outcomes, and so basically we inherited all this and it was designed and when we had to look at whether it, what, what the evidence said about its progress against some of these outcome measures. So they had overall 17 short and medium term outcomes and then four long-term outcomes. So the evaluation looks at the short to medium-term outcomes, so how far they've progressed on those short and medium-term outcomes in 12 months. Now, 17 outcomes would be too much to read on the slide. So what I've done, and what we did for the purpose of the evaluation too, was try to cluster these into groups of what, well, we thought meaningful groups about what these outcomes were meant to achieve. 
And these map comes really around the management of the court process, the coordination of the court process and support. Then there were outcomes around victims and their experiences, so their knowledge and access to the system, and also that for the perpetrators. And then there were outcomes around appropriate orders, perpetrator accountability, and inconsistency amongst different kinds of legal domains in this area. On top of that, we were also asked to consider the statewide implications. So should this go forward? Is this a good model to use for domestic and family violence court processing? As well as the cost effectiveness of this model. And I'm not going to discuss the cost effectiveness today. It was not a full cost effectiveness evaluation. Um, we didn't have the data to do that. It really told us about what the costs were between Ipswich and Southport. And Southport and the specialist model costs more, but Southport always did cost more, even under the old model. Um, so the new model or specialist model does cost more because you have specialist police prosecutors, you have more specialist players in the room, but we're hoping to argue that the outcomes they get around victims outweighs or justifies that additional cost. So what is a specialist domestic violence court? And this was actually what I was asked all the time when I went out and I spoke to people. They said, how is this different than what we're doing now? So the current process in urban locations in Queensland is they have a domestic violence list day. So they take all their civil applications for protection orders being made against intimate partners or other family members and they run them on a single day. And you'll find this in many magistrates courts across Queensland and at the same time they bring in um, some sort of legal aid um, in some of those locations as well as a number of support services who are there for victims at the time. And so this is what they're running anyway. So the first question I was always asked, well, how is this different then than what we were doing before? So what, in some, on one level, it's not that different because one of the ideas around the specialist model is that you have a separate calendar or listing process for these matters. What was different in the Southport model is it also included criminal matters. So it wasn't just the civil processes, it was also the criminal processes that went through a specialist court. So for those who aren't aware, um, it, there are now, Queensland has now identified a number of offences which are aggravated, if you like, if it's undertaken in a context of domestic or family violence. So any time a perpetrator or an offender has been identified uh, who, in a criminal matter like an assault, who's an related under the definitions of this relationship in the Act, then it is, goes to the specialist court in Southport. So it has both a civil and a criminal aspect. The other issue here is the other definition across the world in terms of specialist court is it's dealt with by a single or dedicated group of judicial officers. And this is the first big difference between Southport and the other models, is that under the normal way in which we dealt with it, they rotated the magistrates through. There was no dedicated magistrate who dealt with it. There was no dedicated training for those magistrates. They just rotated magistrates through. Um, and it was you know, so-and-so's turn to do the list now this week. Under the Southport model, you had two dedicated magistrates with who had received specialist training um, and who ran the lists and heard all the cases. The other thing that's often found in common definitions of a specialist approach to domestic violence um, is that it engages associated specialists and including dedicated prosecutors and victim advocates. So although we did have the dedicated victim support services at the courthouse, what we didn't always necessarily have was the full legal representation available at the courthouses for victims and perpetrators. So under the Southport model, we now have a full representation model for both victims and perpetrators. So legal aid was there to provide representation and to provide assistance to both victims and perpetrators. But we also now started to see dedicated prosecutors. Whereas in the um, other listing process, it would be whatever prosecutor was assigned for the day. Here you had a team of police prosecutors who were only worked in the specialist court itself. And over time, those prosecutors at Southport are all civilian now too. They're not, they're not police officers, um, but they are civilian um, lawyers who have been employed by the Queensland Police Service. So when you look more broadly at the literature, what you see are four models of specialist courts that are operating internationally. But unlike Australia, almost all these courts, with some notable exceptions in New York and Toronto, are criminal jurisdiction courts only. And partly this reflects that very few other jurisdictions allow police officers to initiate protection order uh, processes. So in Australia, police officers under all the relevant state legislation can actually put in uh, an application for protection order. This is not the case in the United States. When I've spoken to people over there, they're always a bit amazed by this. It's also not the case in the United Kingdom, although I know they were considering it at one stage. So almost all these models are based on a criminal jurisdiction, not including a civil jurisdiction. So what we're doing in Australia, both 
in, in Queensland but also in Victoria, but is trying to merge a civil kind of model into this process as well. The two notable exceptions here are Toronto and New York, where they've also included family law jurisdiction, as well as your civil protection order jurisdiction and your criminal jurisdictions. And the advantage in those places is that family law is a state-based jurisdiction, it's not in Australia. In Australia, family law is a federal-based jurisdiction, which makes merging all three of those particular jurisdictions problematic. But what we find operating in these places, we find courts that are basically focused on high-risk perpetrators. So what they've done is they've identified high-risk perpetrators or repeat people, and they've basically designed a program to manage them and a convention to manage those. Low-risk ones would go through the normal processes. Or you get an early intervention model, which focuses on low-risk or first-time offenders through the process, and it's very much a more diversionary kind of model. And they're trying to divert them out into other kinds of programs uh, before they get too far embedded into this uh, into the behaviour. Of course, this all recognises that this is the first time they've come into contact with the legal system, not necessarily the first time they've done the behaviour. There's an interventionist model, which is very much a sentencing court model that we see in the drug courts. So it is very much around um, uh, offender treatment and judicial monitoring of sentencing. So the judge sentences you, you report back to the court on a regular basis about your progress on that sentence. And it very much is what we see in the drug court modeling field, uh, drug court um, field. The final model, the integrated model, is the one that was adopted in Southport. And this is one where what we're doing is focusing on building the relationships between all the relevant stakeholders who provide services and who are involved in the legal process, as well as coordinating all those processes more smoothly. And this is really what they were attempting to do at Southport, was to bring all those people together with the victim and perpetrators and provide a better service and a better way of processing and a better experience. And hopefully a better referral process out for both victims and perpetrators. <coughs> so what we did in the evaluation, because we were coming in at almost the 12 month mark, um, not quite, but about is that we didn't have a lot of pre-data we could get before the trial started. So, um, so a lot of it is um, uh, comparison group design. So we have a comparison site as well as the intervention site of Southport. Um, and so we were comparing very much the performance of the two sites under the two different models. Uh, we were able to get some pre-data because the courts routinely collect administrative data. And so obviously we could go back and get that for the 12 months prior to the court trial starting. Um, and we could do that for both sites. But essentially a lot of the things around victim outcomes and victim experience is based on a comparison between two court sites, uh, not a lot of the design. So what we've looked at is court administrative data. We went in and we looked at case files, both criminal case files and civil case files. Um, we did a survey of both perpetrators and victims, and we did more focus groups than I ever care to think about, <laughs> and interviews with magistrates, Domestic violence service providers, Victim Assist Queensland, police prosecutors, defence lawyers, uh, magistrates, um, and then we also went more broadly uh, across the state because we were asked to look at statewide implications, and we talked to Indigenous legal services, um, Indigenous domestic violence referral services, um, and, and so on. So we, over time, <coughs> we, I did something like 25 focus groups in about four weeks. Um, I spent a lot of time, thank you, going between Ipswich and Southport um, and um, actually ended up having more fun than I thought but, um, <laughs> and, I, um, and I got to know some of the people quite well um, and um, which always makes it a bit difficult when you have to write up adverse findings in the end of the report. Uh, and we also collected some financial data um, which I'm not presenting today. So what are the differences between Southport and Ipswich? And why Ipswich? Partly Ipswich because I could actually travel to it. It was in the location that we could actually collect data from in a feasible um, location. Um, when we proposed this, we did not propose a big travel budget, so it wasn't like I could fly up to Townsville um, and do it. But partly is that we had to collect data within a three month period of time, so we needed to keep travel reasonable and minimal in order to do that. Um, Ipswich ran your typical urban court list well, DB list. So we chose your typical urban court that does your typical urban kind of way of managing domestic violence. So you get your civil applications for domestic violence orders being listed on a Monday, um, with just all your four or five magistrates of the court being rotated through, so they do it once a month, um, and their criminal matters just go into their general criminal court. So um, they have some, uh, they have uh, the legal uh, aid come 
um, and they are present, but they don't go into court with either the victims or the perpetrators, although that has now changed. They're not funding for a representation model, but it was an advice model only at the time. The police prosecutors was whoever was rostered on that day, um, and there was no information desk. There were stakeholder meetings, but these happened quarterly, um, and there was much less interaction on a regular basis between the uh, players. And there was um, domestic violence services uh, also present at the court at the time. And there's a safe room, so if a victim was um, uncomfortable or fearful, they could wait in the safe room behind the courthouse and go in a separate door into the courthouse courtroom itself. They also had what they call a men's support worker um, who would see uh, male perpetrators. Um, and the main role there was often to try and get them to agree to voluntary intervention orders, uh, that is to go into men's behavioural programs. So under the civil jurisdiction, it's all consent order to go into behavioural change programs. And so you, you, the idea was to try and convince these men to agree um, to a voluntary intervention order to go into those behavioural management programs. <coughs> um, the other thing that, is, that Southport has that Ipswich doesn't is they do have a specialist court registry just for DV matters. And it's located on the same floor as the courthouse, as the courtrooms for the DV court. It, uh, Southport also does have a safe room or a safety room. Um, support room. Um, they did have different languages for it. There was no place that was quite identical to Southport in terms of the volume of matters. It's always been a very high volume court. So even though we think of Ipswich as having a very high volume, uh, Southport always did have more. So we couldn't match completely on that. We also couldn't match exactly on the number of Indigenous people coming through the court. Um, this um, so. About 6% of applications are known, and that is the person identifies as Indigenous on the application. We believe that may be an undercount because some people are not identifying, but at least based on the data we've got, about 6% of those applications are compared to Ipswich, which is basically double. Um, <coughs> what we do estimate is that the total percentage of domestic violence work done in the magistrate's court, and that's both criminal and civil, and it is an estimate because the criminal cases don't go through a specialist court. Um, which is about a quarter of the, of the magistrate's workload, the magistrate's court workload at Southport would be domestic violence related, compared to about 18% in Ipswich. So Southport has always had this kind of trajectory of a higher level of, of, of <coughs> domestic violence applications. And um, so, but on the other hand, it's got a similar gender, gender profile, it's about 50% on the census data, uh, of women living in the area. Uh, they're both low areas proportionately for um, Indigenous people living within the residents within the area. Similar kinds of proportions of those with non-English speaking backgrounds, so we're not talking Logan area here. Um, and disadvantage indexes that aren't too far apart. So on the census data, they're not too bad a match, but on the port work data, it's obviously a much higher volume. There's not too many places that will match Southport, um, so it was the closest match that we could have <coughs> that was feasible within the timelines. That's just some more. So if we're looking at the type of workload that's done in the two jurisdictions, um, the dark blue is before the trial started, the lighter blue is during that first 12 months of the program, um, and um, you can see that everything's increased regardless of what court you've gone into. So domestic violence applications have gone up, variations on those applications are applying for the protection of the change in some way, breaches of domestic violence have gone up, and we have no pre-data here because there was no flag in the, the court data as to what was domestic violence offence. That flag was introduced in December 2015. So when you have it, that was part way through the trial. Um, so we can't tell whether or not that's changed. So overall, the, tendons, the trend of the state has been to increase. And this may well be to do with the profile, the Not Now, Not Ever report, the profile that it has in terms of the police to do something about these things, and domestic violence agencies perhaps being are more active in this space. However, the increases are greater in Southport. So whether that's a function of the specialist court, I don't have complete evidence to say this one way or the other, but there is some suggestion it might well be a function of having a specialist court there that we've seen greater growth in that jurisdiction. So I just want to summarise the thing of the, the findings of the kind of three key things. One is around the management and coordination of the process. Uh, court experience and then responding to the needs of a diverse or state one implications of going forward with this model. What came out very clearly from the interviews and focus groups was that they really valued having a specialist magistrate there. 
The thought was that they worked under the previous system in Southport, but they, ref but they felt that having someone there who did, this was the only work they did, who really understood the context of domestic violence, the circumstances in which victims and perpetrators were faced with, made a big difference in the way the decision and the coordination of the process happened. And so they identified that it's the depth of knowledge of the legislation, that it was knowledge of other areas that intersect with domestic violence, and here it's particularly family law is a really big issue, and child protection is the other one, and it was an understanding of those intersecting systems was really important. A better understanding of the dynamics and a more detailed knowledge of the support services available to victims and perpetrators really led to better and more informed decision making. So we got quotes like this, and this is not an uncommon one that we got. You know, they understand domestic violence, they know what they're talking about, and they know, you know how the order should be made. And so what was really quite striking here was that all the, all the service providers, the magistrates, the defence lawyers, they were all were very much in favour of having a specialist magistrate and the advantages that that brought in terms of the orders and the appropriateness of the orders um, that were made. <coughs> the other thing that came out really strongly, and it was really quite striking even just being in the court and observing, was the difference in the relationships between the players. There was extremely strong collaborative relationships between all the people, all the legal actors and the social support actors working in the Southport Court. And partly they met weekly to discuss problems and to try and problem solve issues. There was very much a problem solving orientation occurring at this courthouse um, and about making changes that improved the service and what problems they thought they saw. It was highly collegial. It was court led. And one of the comments was, you know, they loved the fact that the magistrate came, but he didn't lead the meeting, or she didn't lead the meeting. Um, they would sit back and they would listen um, to what was going on. And they felt that was really important that they were involved but they weren't necessarily always the active uh, leader in the, the process. So, I mean, I guess what was recognised was that even though you had some of these actors in the process involved previous, previously, they were much more siloed um, than they were under the specialist court model. And the specialist court model had removed some of those silos, improved communication, and had people starting to think about how their role and jobs could be done differently. And some of this was what came out of this is evidence.com um, from the police, uh, the use of an accelerated evidence program where they were using the body of camera evidence and using that to accelerate some of those criminal cases through the domestic violence special support. <coughs> However, one of the big things that were coming out of this was to improve timelines. And so one of the, one of the concerns have been that it takes too long for, for matters to be finalised um, in the domestic violence um, area and that this could be a problem for victims. And did we find that Southport was faster than Ipswich in terms of the specialist court model? No. So what we find is that the average timeline to a temporary order is quicker, and that's because they had a listing policy at Southport that meant that if you came in before 3.30 on the day, your matter got listed and heard. And so most matters would turn out very quickly if you're on a temporary order. What we did, however, find that timelines for final order were longer at Southport. So it was taking longer to get to a final order. Now, were victims not protected? No, they were protected because they had temporary orders in place. But what came out during the interviews and focus groups was that the magistrates were using that time a little bit differently. So they, was, they were using it in order to get defenders into the voluntary intervention orders and having them report back about their progress before they were making final orders. So they were looking at using that process between the temporary order and the final order a little bit differently to see whether or not perpetrators were engaging in behavioural change mechanisms. And there were a number of other kinds of similar kinds of examples about why we might explain that that timeline between, uh, for final orders was longer at Southport than it was um, at Ipswich. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the longer terms were necessarily a bad thing um, in this particular case. What we did notice in both sites, what hadn't changed by having a specialist court, was we didn't see that family law and identification of family law and child protection matters was better. It was still hit and miss. The information still wasn't getting to the specialist court um, in the ways that they had hoped. Um, so it was, they were still missing some child protection issues. They were often um, was uncertainty about what some of the family law orders were. Even though they had improved referral pathways, so they had a very good relationship with the family court registry, so they could fax off requests and get information, they didn't know when to fax off those requests, so they didn't know necessarily there was a family law order in place. So it was still highly dependent on victims um, revealing that information or even understanding um, what their legal status was. 
Um, and so that was certainly an area which they had hoped under the recommendations by having a specialist court could be improved, but hasn't seemed to have happened. And it may also be something that is really hard to do, given that we're dealing with a federal court jurisdiction for the family law cases um, and a state court jurisdiction um, in the protection order, that that communication is always going to be somewhat problematic. When I spoke to Victorian magistrates, um, they were sort of looking at ways in which they could improve the communication between the local federal family court and the magistrates court in this area. Um, but it's always, I think, going to be somewhat problematic given the different jurisdictions. <coughs> The other question, the other issue that came up all the time was that the poor quality of information on private applications made things difficult in terms of decision making and making good decisions, and that even having a special court has not improved the quality of information, and you would not necessarily expect it to. And the role of risk assessment. One of the ideas here was that there was supposed to be some kind of risk assessment happening at some particular point in time. The problem is, is that there were different just definitions about what risk assessment was. So, when I go into interviews and ask them, I get different people telling me different things about what risk assessment meant. So I think part of the problem here is there'd been no broader conversation about what they was meant by risk assessment, what they were supposed to be doing, and what was the purpose of it. Um, so, um, so the domestic violence service providers would do sometimes a little form in the safety room uh, that would help them referral. The, reg the registry would complete a little form that would say whether or not they thought the person might need additional protection on the day. But there was, you know, but it was all a bit hit and miss, and no one actually had the same common understanding of what was meant by risk assessment and what the magistrate's role was on this risk assessment. Um, in Western Australia, they moved away from the sentencing domestic violence court, and they're looking at bail courts and looking at developing a formal risk assessment bail tool um, to use and to go towards the magistrate with that information for that risk assessment. Oh. Uh, at the moment in Queensland, they're still kind of sitting about what they want to do and what the risk assessment means. And the other, obviously, is that the criminal trials have blown out and the uh, trials for protection orders have blown out at Southport, and this is a function of workload. Um, given they've got two magistrates doing it, the timelines to, find, to actually hear contested matters has blown out. Uh, they've taken some, at the time we finished the evaluation, they had some strategies in place. Whether or not those strategies have worked, I don't know. I don't have the most recent data. But, um, but because of all these things that have happened and the volume of matters that have come through Southport, they've um, found that the timeline to criminal trials, how long it takes to get to the trial date, um, have blown out. So they were listing trials in March of the next year, and we're sitting in October. So we were looking at six to eight months for some of these trials. Now, most of them ended up falling on the day or just before because people settled, um, people pled guilty, um, but what we do have is those cases sitting on the force for quite a long time. So the other area, and for many people perhaps the crux of what a specialist court model can do is does it improve the experience for victims? And, um, and they had a whole series of outcomes around this. A lot of it was did it improve victim knowledge and support? So we went in and we did a survey, so we went to the courthouse and we went into the support rooms and we asked victims whether they'd be willing to complete a survey about their experiences when they left the courtroom. So we were only interested in what happened in that courtroom and their experience of what happened in that courtroom. Um, and we got really good, quite good take up in Southport. We got anything from about a 10% response rate on some days to almost 100% response rate on other days. The big problem for us was parking, so people would get out because they'd been waiting for so long to get in, and their parking meter would be expired, so they, they, they weren't able to stay. But we ended up with 65 surveys at Southport um, of victims that we collected over a three or four week period. Um, and hopefully my research assistants, they, they were a very good team of research assistants that went in every day um, and hung out in the support room um, to recruit our victims for us. And what we did on this is we asked them about how they came. So was it through police? Was it a private initiated matter? What services they used? What were their expectations before coming to court? How they felt about what had happened in the courtroom and whether they understood the order. So we actually asked them, say, well, what was their order about? So from this data, what we can tell is that um, we didn't get as much uptake at Ipswich. Um, we only had 20 to 21 uh, victims at Ipswich. Um, that was even more problematic in terms of parking at Ipswich than it was at Southport. Um, and it possibly may also reflect a different culture in the courthouse as well, um, in terms of it was a much more collaborative and collegial feel there, and that, I don't know whether that's had any impact upon the uptake or the willingness of victims to hang around and complete the survey. <coughs> but <coughs> given some of the limitations of the sample size, what we do see is that regardless of where they went, most people saw a court support worker, a victim, 
Um, but the big differences here are more people, more victims saw a duty lawyer or publicly funded lawyer at the specialist court than they did at the, in the mainstream regular way of doing things. Um, and, but most people also access the support of safe rooms. So most, people, most of the victims did hang out now in the safe room. When we were asked them to assess how, what they thought about that service, there wasn't striking differences here between how satisfied people were when they were at South Port of Ipswich. Um, although the big one might be in the support and safe room. You know, we had 68% of people in Southport rating it as a, as a good to excellent service compared to 50% of Ipswich. But overall we would say that there's good access to support services regardless of courthouse, but there's probably better access around legal services at Southport uh, under the specialist model. So we also asked um, perpetrators um, also similar kinds of questions about um, whether it was a private or police initiated matter, the relationship with the, the person involved, um, <coughs> what kind of sport, what kind of services they accessed, and their experience on the day. Of course, we got lower uptake at Ipswich. We had about 10 to 13, depending on what question we look at. But we got 64 perpetrators at Southport. So we got similar numbers at Southport um, responding to the surveys from perpetrators. Um, partly, the court runs five days a week, not once, so we've got more opportunity to recruit people. Um, and we were able to pick up some criminal matters at Southport, which we weren't able to do at Ipswich either. So most of what I'm saying here, I should have said it earlier, it really speaks to the civil side of the matters rather than the criminal side of the matters. So I'm not going to take much from the comparison because the numbers are so small at Ipswich. Although we've done as well as other people have done in this particular kinds of research. But overall, we see at Southport things that we want to see. Most men actually go in, and I say men because most of them were men, um, go in and see a court support worker. You know, more, about three quarters go and see, go and seek legal advice and see someone. And the process at Southport is pushed, pushing them to do that. I mean, they're asked all the time, you want to go and see a lawyer, and the lawyer comes out and sees them, so you're sure you don't want advice. So the whole process is set up to make sure that people do get access and aren't just sitting there um, a bit... Um, uh, you know, not sure that they, they want to ask. Um, the satisfaction levels, of course, are obviously a little low in this, um, but which is not surprising. But that court support worker, once again, even at Southport, is all aimed about getting them into mentally behavioural training programs. It's not a general support service, and so it's not a support service for male victims. And this came out quite clearly. We didn't have that many male victims, but we did have some. And they were very much, felt very much neglected in the process felt that there weren't the services available to them, because if you go into the court support office, it's all full of posters for men's behavioural change. Um, all the brochures are about men's behavioural change, there's nothing there for them for victims. And so even though one might argue, and some domestic violence support services did argue, that maybe there are no such things as male victims, as far as the court's concerned, they do come in as a victim, and that's the role that they have in that legal process. Um, and yet they had very little access to the kinds of support services that were available for the female. So, but the really interesting one for me was, did victims rate their experience more positively um, than um, victims who'd gone through the usual um, kind of uh, court process? So what we did was we asked a series of, of um, questions around what could be happening in here. These are just some of the items that I put up here. This is Southport, this is Ipswich. You know, did they have enough time to tell them what happened? Were they able to tell the magistrate about the impact of what happened? For those of you who are procedural justice scholars, some of these might seem very similar. And they really were around this kind of idea about procedural justice, whether they felt that there was a procedural justice process going on, felt that their story had uh, been taken into account, that they were believed, treated with respect, the process was fair. Overall, when we look across all these dimensions across Southport and Ipswich, bearing in mind we've only got 20-something respondents at Ipswich, um, <coughs> I don't mean respondents in the legal sense, I mean it in terms of participating in my survey, um, we see that the means are higher at Southport, that overall they were more positive about their experience, felt they had been more fair, felt that they'd been more likely to be listened to, um, and felt that they had greater treatment of respect. So they very generally reported higher levels of perceived procedural justice at Southport under the specialist court model than they did under the general urban model of just a DB list. And for me, for my, in my point of view, this is probably one of the most important findings of the evaluation, was the difference that it made to victims' experience. 
They also reported a much higher level of understanding of their court outcomes, so they said that they did understand it. Um, um, this is all self-report. If we actually asked them some questions, maybe they didn't. But certainly, it's certainly quite clear that uh, there was more processes in place, both for perpetrators as well as victims, to explain that order. So the court order would be printed out on site for them in the, in the safe room for victims at, at Southport, because we had a court officer located in that courtroom, in the safe room and it would be explained to them again. The lawyers, wherever possible, would go back to talk to either victim and perpetrator to make sure that they could answer questions about the order as well, so they tried to make sure that they touched base before they left the courthouse. And those kinds of processes do seem to have made a difference in terms of people's perceived or self-reported understanding of what happened in the courtroom on the day. Um, as you can see, for Ipswich, um, it's a bit concerning that over 20% were saying they were unsure about what actually got on the day. And this is a civil protection order. What is more interesting, and this is the question I didn't think would work, so we needed a measure of perpetrator accountability. And there's, we had a big discussion with the domestic violence reform team about what perpetrator accountability meant. And most definitions of accountability are in the criminal justice arena, and so Robin Holder's work, for instance, works a lot through its you know, mission of wrongfulness, it's the perpetrator's willingness to, you know, to respond or change behaviour. But all of these have been developed out of the criminal jurisdiction about out of sexual assault and, and research on this. So we were trying to do this in what was largely a civil context um, and whether or not this perpetrator accountability works or even conceptualised in the same way in a civil, uh, civil context, where there's no finding of guilt. Um, and in fact, many orders are made um, where people consent to the order but don't make admissions. So they're not admitting that anything's gone wrong. And that's the most typical order was to, to consent to the order but without any legal admissions. So what we did do in the, in the, in the survey for um, the perpetrators in the, uh, was to ask them whether or not, and it was a single question, they understood their behaviour was wrong. And I didn't know what we'd get. It was an attempt. I thought we wouldn't be able to use it. Surprisingly, we got more variation on it than I thought, which makes me think that people were being reasonably honest in this question. They weren't just all saying, no, I don't think it is, or socially desirably saying, yes, of course I do. So when we asked perpetrators in both um, Ipswich and Southport, although I wouldn't pay too much attention to that one because the numbers are so small, we actually got um, people willing to say on a five point market scale that they are uh, some variation and that most of them did proceed to report that they understood that their behaviour needed to change. So this is some indication that potentially the specialist court model may be prompting some perpetrators to consider what their behaviour actually was. When we asked agree, so these are the victims. Um, whether they felt that the magistrate was holding the, the perpetrator to account, that the behaviour was actually declared as wrong or inappropriate in the courtroom. What we found in Southport is that there was, except for this one here, is that overwhelmingly there, um, the respondents at the agrees at Southport who did the survey did say that in the courtroom the magistrate said it was wrong and it was against the law. So there was a sense of legal accountability, if you like. The one where we saw very little difference is whether or not they thought that the other person had taken responsibility for their behaviour. And that's not surprising. None of them walked out of the courtroom feeling uh, any significantly different. So the specialist court model didn't at least look to, to providing victims with a better sense that the, the offender was taking more responsibility for their behaviour. And it's a bit hard, as I said, when you're looking at a civil model where you can consent to an order without making any admissions about your behaviour. So we have believe that this is some evidence that, at least from a victim's perspective, the court is a place where legal accountability is happening in a way that hasn't happened in the more regular DV list. Some of the issues that we came up with that we think are problematic, and I can't remember what my time is, so... I'll uh, about five... Six, I told people six, 30 minutes, and I've probably been going on for now. Um, lack of attendance, regardless of whether it was a specialist court or not, uh, there was an issue of lack of attendance, particularly around the perpetrators. If you're relying on those support systems that are available at court to be the referral pathways out, then it's problematic when they don't turn up because then you haven't got a place of contact to refer out. Not everyone agrees with me that this is a problem because some people say, well, part of this is victims don't shouldn't have to come to court and be exposed, potentially re-victimised. But there's other kinds of body of work that suggests it can be very empowering to actually come to court and have a magistrate say, no, this behaviour is wrong and to be able to be listened to and to tell your story. So there's mixed views on whether or not attendance is an issue, but what we do know is that if, you, if all the support structures and the referral pathways 
are placed in the courthouse, their lack of attendance is an issue because we're not capturing those, a certain group of people and, and placing them in those referral, uh, referral pathways. Um, so these are, the, these are the attendance statistics based on records kept by the registry. And as you can see, and this is people who did not attend, so by and large there's not much difference over time around attendance at Southport and about 60% of respondents um, don't come um, and to their matters. So their matters are heard, either they're adjourned or their matters are heard without them present. And even though the attendance rates are normally higher for degrees, particularly if you're a private applicant, so you've taken out the application yourself, not the police, um, we're still looking around 50% uh, do not turn up on the day. Now, sometimes it's because the police, in um, police matters, have said that's okay, we'll do it on your behalf. But if we're relying on that support room to be the place where we do some safety checks and give safety advice, then that's a problem. And it's not much difference between the court sites. So Southport and Ipswich have fairly similar um, attendance rates. So having a specialist court hasn't really made a big difference in that sense. So when I talked um, and, and asked this question in the focus groups, and this is where the dichotomy about whether attendance was important really came out, is it particularly came out um, around the man respondents about not, not turning up, um, because they did see this issue around accessing services. This was the place that they accessed services. So if they don't turn up, then there was no way we were getting hold of them. And there was no way we were, we were talking about getting them into mental behavioural programs, because that discussion happened at the The other issue that came up was the lack of support for non-traditional victims and perpetrators, which I've already mentioned. So if you're a female perpetrator versus a male victim, female perpetrators would be in the safe room, as well as the female victims. It was determined on gender, not on your status in the process. Um, if you felt uncomfortable with that and your perpetrator turned up first, then you'd, be, you'd have to wait out in the waiting room if you were the victim in that case, the female victim in that case. So even though these aren't huge numbers, and we could have a debate about what the numbers really are, um, and I know there's various theories around this. At least from the point of view of courts, this is the status that people present at. And the question is, is what support should we be offering for people who are presenting in these non-traditional cases? And certainly, um, when um, some of the couple of male victims actually spoke to me after they had done their surveys, there was a great deal of angst and frustration and a feeling of being treated differently and not being believed about their victim status. So, and you can see, you know, we support both you know, we'll see each woman and support them, but they can't both be in the support room, so someone has to go outside, often it's who comes first. Um, it's top heavy, and that is all about the aggrieved. Um, and the other gap is um, what happens with parents and children, and some of the, so all the support services are also based primarily on intimate partner violence models, so what happens when we get these non-traditional models. Uh, it had been mentioned in a number of the focus groups and interviews that they were seeing growing parent-children matters, particularly adult children abusing their parents. Um, and you know, what we, we talk about mental behavioural change programs, but once again, they're often based around intimate partner violence models rather than the family violence models. And so what we identified was need for better support, both before, during, and after. And that, so they need to be support in terms of helping people prepare, so better preparation of applications, which meant matters may be finalised more quickly because they have better information on it right through to some kind of follow-up contact afterwards so that the people were actually plugged into support and referral services. <coughs> um, there are other issues around um, perpetrator programming, so the men's behavioural change programs. There's no consistency in terms of what's offered, so the, the programs at Ipswich are different in terms of length than the programs at Southport. It depends on who is the, is the organisation that offers the model. And I know if anyone knows the research around perpetrator programming, there's very a lot of research around what actually does work in this and how long these programs need to be. And currently a lot of those perpetrator programs don't meet some of those best practice standards that we're offering. Um, they're all, also a one for all kind of programs. So if you have people coming from non-English speaking backgrounds, um, cultural backgrounds where we deal with gender is dealt with differently than in a Western culture, then one might argue that you might need, you're dealing with different kinds of issues. It's not just the intimate partner violence issue, it's also the issue around gender stratification and the gender role of gender more generally in that cultural context. When I spoke to some magistrates working in other jurisdictions, this has become a bigger issue about what you do as they're seeing increasing numbers of, from, of, of perpetrators and victims from these communities coming through, is where do you send them? And it's not just the language about whether or not 
they have enough sufficient English to deal with these programs, but it's also the fact that these issues will present differently. So what we did find um, when we looked at it, we didn't get very many victims or perpetrators from diverse communities. Um, we certainly, there was hope that we would get people from non-traditional relationships. We didn't see very many people like that. We mainly saw intimate partner, male, female, and, we may, and then the other ones we saw were family, and often it was sisters uh, or children and parents. But it was predominantly intimate partners, what we saw um, in our surveys. Um, and, uh, but when we spoke to agencies that deal with um, uh, culturally and linguistic diverse communities and with indigenous communities, what comes out is that they're probably not using the legal systems, that many are wary, and none of this is probably surprises anyone in this room, many are very wary about engagement with the police or with the justice system more generally. This is often complicated by visa issues if you're an immigrant and the way in which domestic violence is dealt with um, through the visa process. Um, many don't necessarily always understand that you're coming on a fiancé visa, that just because you separate because of domestic violence doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be kicked out of the country. There's also pressure if you've come in that, you, that your partner may be deported because he's now being convicted of some kind of domestic violence and there's pressure within those communities to send back someone to a war-torn country you know, facing bullets, poverty, poor. I mean, when you, how can you send someone back to those kinds of conditions? And so a great deal of, of, of pressure on some of those women um, because of the conditions in which some of these men would be sent back to. Some of the other concerns raised by some of these service providers is that there was no support for women. They didn't get the support here from their communities. And if they went back home, they certainly wouldn't have got support in their communities back home. So they were in these no-win kind of situations. How many we're dealing with is really unclear. We just don't know. We don't know what the numbers are. But once again, what came out was that it was the strength and value of partnerships within the community organisations and with the court that was really vital in improving the access to the justice and improving the understanding of what the illegal position was. And that the appropriate interventions is actually much more critical in this space by what they look like. And that our current program probably really doesn't match the needs of these kinds of groups. So for many of the service providers here, they said it's not just me kind of saying, your behaviour is wrong, we need to adjust this. It was actually convincing people that the behaviour was wrong in the first place. There were the real cultural issues around what you know, the relationship was between a head of household and how he, or how he could treat the members of his household. And they were dealing with broader issues, but not just the, you know, the convincing that you need to go in and change your behaviour. Um, and you know, explaining the differences between punishment and discipline of children and what that means in an Australian context and Australian legal system compared to where that comes from. So what did we conclude? We conclude there'd been strong progress on most of these outcomes, but there were still obviously gaps and there's still issues to be dealt with. The specialist court hadn't solved everything. But there were strongly positive assessments from victims. It was quite clear that victims really had felt that the process was working, that they were satisfied with the process, they had more positive experiences, and they had a sense that at least the behaviour was recognised by the legal system as a problem, even if we weren't seeing it necessarily in the sense of what their, their, uh, their disorders were. We also saw extremely positive assessments from the people working within the system. Um, so there were very few concerns or even criticism of the specialist court model in those interviews or focus groups um, uh, that were conducted at Southport. So the specialisation, having all those specialist professionals, so we had police prosecutors who just dealt with the specialist court. We had the DV service providers who just dealt with the specialist court. We had defence lawyers who were specialists in family and, and civil processes. All of them coming together and meeting on a regular basis, and that was weekly, led to the development of unique processes over time. So when I went into the court in July, by September when I finished, they had different, some different processes in place as they evolved over time. It was not static. And it was that kind of specialisation of all the people together in that kind of collaborative atmosphere meant we had this ongoing improvement process happening um, over time. It didn't always happen as fast as they wanted, um, or necessarily in the ways that they necessarily all wanted, but what we saw were changes and improvements <coughs> in response to concerns and issues. And it, it did improve the ability for them to liaise out with other kinds of services and broaden the kinds of networks um, that, that was originally involved in these things as well. And there was this explicit management of people. So rather than just asking people whether they wanted to see a lawyer, there was a process and you were seen places. So and that increased the likelihood of male perpetrators actually talking to a court support officer. It increased the likelihood that people actually went and spoke to a lawyer and received legal advice. Um, and so the idea was to try and maximise these opportunities so that people were as best informed as possible to make decisions. Um, and that seemed to have happened under the special support. 
But I can only say this for the civil jurisdiction. The criminal jurisdiction really didn't seem to operate that much differently than it does in a general court, other than it went to, a, it went to the specialist court. A lot of the stuff was run on a separate list, so because it got so much, breach day was Friday. So sentences for breaches were Friday. Um, when I went in and I observed this court, man, it didn't seem that much different than my sitting in breaches anywhere else in other courts. So even though you had a specialist magistrate there, the process in the criminal jurisdiction looked like more could be done. But the civil matters, because there's so many of them, had been the primary focus, and that what we could do in the criminal space actually still required some further discussion and development um, in the specialist court model. <coughs> So we had, we sort of, I've come to the conclusion that, that there's more work that the specialist court could do in the criminal justice space, in the criminal jurisdiction, um, but this was not enough to say that the court itself was a failure or hadn't met these short and medium term um, goals, because it certainly seemed to have made very good progress in terms of the civil, in the civil jurisdiction. So I won't bore you with my 17 recommendations. However, you might like to know that the government, as part of their budget, did say they were going to make South Court Court permanent. Um, which was my recommendation one, and did also um, have rolled it out to two other locations. So they're going to Townsville and Ipswich. Um, being where Ipswich is like a passive court. Um, and they're also going to child circuit courts, um, which was something else that we endorsed from the Not Now, Not Ever report as well. Um, but we also made a number of recommendations around victim support um, and about adapting to local conditions that you just can't take the model in Southport and dump it in Beanley. You've got to consider the local conditions in Beanley, which are quite different. Um, as you can know, there's a lot of refugee communities and resettlement um, going on around that area. But what came out of all of this is the crucial role of magisterial leadership, the role of the magistrate in all of this, and their role in driving it, but as well as the importance of collaboration and partnerships, not to stay in those silos and just turn up on court day, but to have a genuine kind of collaboration um, between all those agencies. That there's importance to sustain support. It's not just enough to offer support on the day at the courthouse, um, it really needs to be people properly prepared and then, I'm not saying that we have to court has to follow people for two years afterwards, but for some kind of level of touching base at, uh, after the process um, to ensure that you know, people did understand the court orders and what needed to happen. What we were finding that a number of the breaches, and this was mentioned in a number of my interviews and focus groups, that often the breaches, and I won't use the term technical because I got more upset about it, I'm using more technical breaches because they're all important. But some of them would, um, were allowed to contact um, or to arrange childcare, you know, switching off, by texting. And so he would text, you know, what about such and such time? She wouldn't respond within you know, 30 seconds or whatever people would expect to be responded by. Text again, and then text again, and text again. So it was 20 texts, about the same amount. But I'm allowed to text around child. Now, some of this might be manipulation of the rules, but in some cases there was a feeling it was genuine misunderstanding that one text is fine. But 20 texts in 10 minutes is not, and that's actually a violation of your order. So part of this is actually ensuring that ongoingly that there is education for perpetrators around what does it mean, what does contact actually mean. And therefore, you know, and, and so you need to wait and you can't expect responses in a certain time. You can make contact and if she doesn't get back to you, I'm sorry, but you then need to go to someone else who then makes the contact. So they are now looking at ways in which we can provide better information to perpetrators around what some of those conditions mean and what really will be a violation and what's not. Um, and part of it might be, maybe some of these are not genuine cases, but the idea is, is when you start providing this education, then you lose that excuse that I didn't understand. Well, actually, no, we told you. Um, and so moving <coughs> forward, the idea is that we need some kind of level of sustained support around that understanding of what the orders mean. What came out really strongly, however, was specialisation became a really important way for the stakeholders to manage what were really complex situations and circumstances of people's lives. And the fact that it wasn't just one organisation that could do this, it actually was an intersection of multiple organisations and multiple fa facets of law involved in this. And, and um, so specialisation became a, a really useful way for being able to <coughs> manage some of this complexity and ensure that processes ran more smoothly than when we just put them into a general jurisdiction. I'll leave it there. Thank you. I should also acknowledge that I wasn't the only person on the project. Um, um, uh, my colleagues are Robin Holder, uh, 
was Beth Jeffries and Chris Fleming, who did the cost effectiveness analysis with Bergen Business School. And I had a whole team of RAs who went into the courthouse and did those surveys for me and coded case files. And without them, that would be a good honor. So I'm very grateful to them for the time. Right, thank you. With the, with the civil orders, do they have the, the non-attendance, are they kind of obliged to attend? Or is it just like a of I, very good question. Um, the, which means, if you're talking from the point of view of the applicant should attend, but in right. most cases the applicant's a police officer. All right. And so the police prosecutor essentially takes that role and attends on behalf of the police. And many times they will may they may this is really where it got unclear and it was never I was never could disentangle or exactly what the police were necessarily telling victims around their attendance in those matters. But most of our applications are police initiated applications, so they appear as the applicant. So the person who's the respondent in the matter, the perpetrator, receives a letter that tells them they should attend court. But a lot of time, well, as you saw, they don't. Yeah. And so there's the strategy, so magistrates will often adjourn, try again, mm -hmm. or orders can be made in their absence if they just if the magistrate decides then and then, or after even adjourned ones, they can make an order in their absence. So would that be contempt of court if you have an order to appear and just don't appear? It's a civil. Um, and so and they don't tend to Yeah, we don't have to because it's no, a civil okay. matter. It's not a criminal matter. So even though the letter basically says you should attend. I don't think because it's a civil matter. I think you basically no. lose your right to defend yourself. It's essentially what you lose rather than being mandated. It's different than in a criminal case. Mm. Uh, but even then, people don't turn up for their criminal matters. <laughs> no, but you can't, but you can't yeah. issue a bench warrant. You know, I mean, that's the no, case. you can't issue a bench warrant in a civil matter. Yeah. So it is complicated because we're using the civil law to address a particular yeah. behaviour, and the civil law has been the primary mechanism in Australia for dealing with domestic violence. Yeah. And it, Tends, it's been, it's overwhelmed using a criminal response for this behaviour. Um, it's only more recently that we've got more concerned about doing a criminal response and charging people who have assaulted rather than just choosing to take out protection orders. Um, it's quite different in other jurisdictions and uh, internationally where they have taken a more criminal response because there isn't that police initiated option for a protection order. And I think that might be one of the differences in Australia is because police have been able to initiate protection orders in the civil space. I wonder if there's an issue with that, though, because a lot of those civil cases where the police take out the applications has actually been an offence has been committed, but the police will take the easier way and do a civil rather than actually treating it as a criminal. In the past, an assault. Yeah. So I don't know if the, the latest legislation changes. And In the past, that. I think there's been some misunderstanding about whether or not they could do both, and we had to make a choice. And so some anecdotal evidence I've received, I've, I've heard, is that police officers thought they had to do either or. Um, and, they were, and the victim was often uncooperative. So the question is, is, do I want to proceed ahead with a criminal matter where I've got an uncooperative victim? What's happening increasingly, particularly down at the Gold Coast, is they're saying, no, what we need to do is go into it. If it's a crime, we investigate it the same way we investigate any other crime. And we don't always have to rely on victim evidence. If we've got other evidence, like I've taken photos of the scene, I've got a neighbour giving me you know, part of a statement, and I would proceed if it was not you know, why wouldn't I proceed in this case? So there is now a push to doing both the charging as well as the protection order, and that's starting to be reflected, I think, in those figures. I don't know what the impact of the changes in the police protection notice will make in some of this stuff. Uh, for anyone who's interested, there have been big changes in the police protection notices. But that wasn't the case then. Yes. <coughs> is there any interest in or possibility for a follow-up of these individuals a year from so now? So the plan is, well, what we've recommended is that in three years there be a final evaluation of the specialist court. Um, and um, I think there was always a plan because we never looked at those long term um, outcomes, which were things like behaviour change amongst perpetrators and things like this. Um, so, yes, the, the idea is, and we certainly recommended that in three years, which is what 2020 or whatever that is, um, that there be a final full evaluation of some of those longer term impacts. And would that include follow ups with individuals? Well, that's up to whoever does the evaluation. Oh, I see. So you're done with this part? Well, that's what we've been contracted to do. Right. Okay. I mean, I'm very happy that they come back and knock at my door and say, could you please do? But the contact details and that sort of thing weren't collected at the time 
because not wasn't for not much. for the not for the um, actual surveys, right? But obviously, the system is information which allows us to track them through in every contact of the system, right? So you can see how many times they've returned mm. when they've breached a law and that kind of stuff. Um, can I just ask a couple of questions? Um, I imagine because it was essentially a process of evaluation, essentially, there doesn't seem to be. You didn't ask any questions about feelings of safety. That, is that you know? So when you've asked your victims questions, they seem to be procedural justice questions. Oh, we did ask if they felt safe at the court because we were concerned about the court processes and that sort of stuff. So we have there is a question in the survey asking whether they felt safe on the day of court. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head what we found or what the answers were. Um, I suspect, uh, from I suspect because I don't remember, it was probably that they all felt basically safe. So we have some safety questions around their experience at the court on the day. Um, but one of the longer term goals of the court process is whether or not victims are safer. Yeah. The problem with some of those longer term outcomes is how do you measure them? And can we expect a court process to legitimately change behaviour in perpetrators? Um, and whether those are outcomes which are achievable through a court process. Mm -hmm. um, so they want some kind of perpetrator accountability outcome. The question is, is for a court, what should that look like? So, and then whether behaviour changes the way behavior. I mean, I think it's been quite good the way it's been framed so narrowly around what it's promising. Yeah.